You've got to see the world our way, Big D. Mm-hmm. Well, see it yeah. through your vampire eyes. Oh, my goodness. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash, father of all lies, the Lion Court. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shad on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, Lovecraft Country, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all the information and past episodes at ShadOnTV.com. And finally, to hang out with us live all week long, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, ShadTheMovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games and host watch parties. All that being said, <laughs> Big D, what movie are we reviewing tonight? Gene, tonight we will go oh down God. into the dark world of the vampires, into the catacombs in Paris, and we will join our brothers Josh and Adam R. as we review the 1994 <laughs> gothic horror film, Interview with a Vampire. Oh! Yay! <laughs> uh, y'all, I have had chills all day waiting for this, and... I just want to, before reading, just want to send a big heartfelt thank you to Joshua. Oh, my God. It and Joshua. Hot flashes. Mm, I, not reached menopause yet. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, oh, um, and Joshua wrote in and said, greetings once again, Shat Gang. When my brother Adam proposed the idea of potentially doing a book to movie adaptation, Shat Off, and Rice's interview with a vampire immediately popped in my head and is a movie well worth the pantheon of Shat. Now, in full transparency, this is a movie that I saw first, then read the book, then subsequently rewatched over the years. Ever since The Lost Boys, I always thought the vampire genre made for great movies, but this movie was unlike most others, and that the vampires were actually the focal point rather than just something to be feared. When I originally saw Tom Cruise cast as Lestat, even knowing nothing at the time about the character, I, much like Anne Rice, thought him to be the wrong choice. However, similar to Rice, after seeing his Lestat on screen, I too felt he gave a great performance. The remaining cast is stellar, and the movie's macabre tone is beautifully shot. As with all movies adapted from books, there are some glaring differences, from the catalyst of Louis' initial depression, to Claudia's age, to their travels between New Orleans and Paris, to among other things, the fact that far more exposition is given in the book to what it actually means to be a vampire. Probably the most glaring difference, aside from the actual ending, is the character of Armand. Though Antonio Banderas is perfectly cast, save the hair color, in the book, Armand plays a much more central role, whereas in the movie, he's unfortunately, essentially, a subplot. All in all, I'd say Interview with the Vampire is a close, though not perfect, adaptation of its source material. While it might not be as close as, say, Of Mice and Men, at over three times the number of pages, it's a far longer and more complex story. Then again, I imagine Adam has grown accustomed to certain things just being smaller in his life. Oh. Anyway, have fun with it. And I can't wait to hear your take, particularly Jeans, as the resident vampire expert. 
P.S. As to why I think I should win this challenge, let's be honest. Just because a movie is more faithful to its source material doesn't mean it's a better cinematic experience. To be fair, Of Mice and Men is a great book, but I think Adam's reverence for it comes from the fact that he personally identifies with Lenny, perhaps a little too much. (laughs) Don't worry, Adam. I'll be sure to get you some ketchup for your beans and rabbits to play with while the adults in the room read real books and watch real movies. All the best, Joshua. So we often talk on Shout the Movies about movies that are long overdue. People write in and tell us that an actor or a particular film is long overdue. We've been doing this for five years now, and how do we miss that movie? Interview the Vampire honestly did not come up in conversations until this challenge. And as soon as we posted it, Josh, the listenership went wild. They're all about this yeah. movie. And I think it really is one of those movies that's kind of in secret, very, very popular with people who were teens and young adults uh, in the 90s. So I'm excited to get to it. Uh, as a non-immortal myself, as a muggle, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I was surprised by this. The, the outpouring of passion for this movie has surprised me like no other movie we've done before. I think we forget that, like, you know, before J.K. Rowling, before God help us, Stephanie Meyer, and all of those, you know, the big wave of YA lit, like, I mean, what other book series was, like, bigger than the Vampire Chronicles, right? Like, I mean, it was a massive deal from the 70s and the 80s and through the early 90s. That's why it was such a big deal when this movie got made, because people love this book and people love this series. And for a while, it was almost like a guilty pleasure. And then this movie, I think, brought it to the mainstream. And a lot of housewives, before they read like, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, were reading, you know, vampire books. I should also clarify that Josh was referencing the fact that I was brought on Shat the Movies for the first time as the resident vampire expert for mm-hmm. The Lost Boys. But now with Ash by my side, the Armand to my Louis, uh, we will tackle this together. Along with our familiar, Big D. Oh, you motherfucker. Now I know what you're talking about. You're not going to feed on me. I'm not going to keep you alive. It's not going to work. You're just going to do our bidding. We won't feed on you. Oh, hell no. No, I'm going to kill you in your sleep. Well, Interview the Vampire is a 1994 gothic horror film directed by Neil Jordan based on Anne Rice's 1976 novel of the same name and starring Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. The film focuses on Lestat, played by Tom Cruise, and Louis, played by Pitt, beginning with Louis' transformation into a vampire by Lestat in 1791. The film chronicles their time together and their turning of 10-year-old Claudia, played by Kirsten Dunst, into a vampire. The narrative is framed by a present-day interview in which Louis tells his story to a San Francisco reporter. The supporting cast features Christian Slater, Antonio Banderas, and Stephen Ree. The film was released in November 1994 to generally positive reviews and was a commercial success. It received Oscar nominations for Best Art Direction and Best Original Score. Kirsten Dunst was additionally nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress for her role in the film. A standalone sequel, Queen of the Damned, was released in 2002 with Stuart Townsend replacing Tom Cruise as Lestat. So Big D... Ash, we always ask what your memories are of the movie we are covering. Tonight, it is Interview the Vampire, and we'll start with you, Ash. So we've talked a lot on this pod about movies that were like really important to our lives. And this is definitely up there for me. I have always loved the vampire genre. If you are a Dana Buckler Show listener, Dana and I did a whole vampire series that lasted a couple of months because we went through like all of the vampire movies. Like I love them. Creatures of the Night are some of my favorite things on the planet. And Anne Rice's vampires have always been a favorite of mine. Um, This is also set in my hometown. So this is like a weird amalgam of like my love of New Orleans with my my love of all things dark and immortal. And it makes my gothic heart like so incredibly happy to be doing this tonight. And I also remember being from New Orleans, how big of a deal this movie was when it was filmed, because this is like pre Hollywood coming to New Orleans post Katrina. And I happen to know two people that are in it. Shout out to Tom Duggar and Heidi St. Romain. And I remember this massive excitement that everybody in the city had about having you know, Pitt and Cruise there. There were stories from the set. Like it made the news that Tom Cruise insisted on a 
ditch being dug for Brad Pitt to walk in when they were walking along the river. So Tom Cruise was taller than him still. And, you know, things like that just kind of infected our lives for months. And it also started Brad Pitt's love affair with New Orleans, which he would make good on after Katrina. And I just apologize in advance because I truly do love this film. I love this story. A year ago when this commission came in, I started looking forward to it. And so Fangirl Ash is going to check in now and um, we'll see how it goes. So, Josh, you mentioned that you saw the movie before reading the book. I'm in the same boat. And Anne Rice writes about her vampires being born into the darkness. I believe that every goth has this experience, too. Like, even if we're born goth, we don't know it yet. We have to we have to find that, right? And for me, there was this series of influences in junior high and high school. And it started with seeing Interview with the Vampire. And then reading the book and then reading the sequels and then getting into Anne Rice's Lives of the Mayfair Witches, listening to Tori Amos's Boys for Pele, and then getting into Nick Cave's entire Southern Gothic catalog, The Craft, LeVay and Satanism, having candles and runes in my bedroom, going clubbing two to three nights a week and getting home mm-hmm. just in time to shower and go back to high school. Like that was life. And it all started this, you know, 30 year, nearly 30 year journey started with this movie it's what made me wow okay uh i worked at a video store blockbuster (laughs) this was one of those movies that i rented because everybody's talking about it i watched it after a shift and i made it to paris paris i fell asleep next night i started back up in paris i made it to the golden gate bridge but vampires admittedly they're not my thing i would have rather been a colonial marine I would have rather been, you know, on the Millennium Falcon with Han Solo and Chewbacca or an ice pirate. So this wasn't my bag, (laughs) but I do remember it. And I do remember that it was a big deal in the store and people kept coming back and kept asking for this movie. And no, dude, we don't have any tapes behind the boxes. That means it's out. Mm, So go find another movie. God, I just had like PTSD of like going and finding the movie with no movies behind it. Jesus. Oh my God. And then if they heard, God forbid, the Dropbox Mm. make noise, like, (laughs) can you go check it? Dude, we got 30,000 titles. What do you think? That's your movie? Okay, I'll go check. And then cha-ching. Oh, could you check it again? I was like like a monkey, a monkey on a string. I was that person. Yeah, seriously. I love the generational difference where Ash and I just didn't have jobs at the time. And Big D's like, fucking interview with the vampire. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Big D, well, let's crack open this coffin and hit the trailer. I want you to see we get started. So you want me to tell you the story of my life? I'll tell you my story. I'll tell you all of it. I'm flesh and blood, but not human. I haven't been human for 200 years. From the novel by Anne Rice. From Neil Jordan, the director of The Crying Game. I've come to answer your prayers. Life has no meaning anymore, does it? His name is Lestat. What if I could give it back to you? Pluck out the pain and give you another life. One you could never imagine. I can see you lying on a bit of satin. He chose one man. He gave him infinite power. Eternal life. And a daughter who would be forever young. This is the only real evil left. And then he took the light of day. You're a vampire. You never knew what life was until it ran out in a red gush over your lips. I can't stand this any longer. You made us what we are, didn't you? God kills indiscriminately, and so shall we. You like dying? You condemn me to hell! A monster. One happy family. Take her to eat. End her suffering and yours. For do not doubt, you are a killer! I want some more. Tom Cruise. Brad Pitt. 
Pitt, Stephen Ray, Antonio Banderas, Kirsten Dunst, and Christian Slater. Interview with the Vampire. In modern day San Francisco, reporter Daniel Malloy interviews Louis de Point du Lac, who claims to be a vampire. Louis describes his human life as a wealthy plantation owner in 1791, Louisiana. Despondent following the death of his family, he drunkenly wanders one night and is attacked by the vampire Lestat de Lioncourt, who offers to turn him into a vampire. Louis accepts, but quickly comes to regret it. While Lestat revels in the hunt and killing of humans, Louis resists his instinct to kill, instead drinking animal blood to sustain himself. Disgusted by Lestat's pleasure in killing, Louis comes to suffer tremendously as a vampire. So this challenge between Of Mice and Men and Interview with the Vampire centers on book adaptations, which is the better book adaptation. And I feel like the best film adaptations combine the book's key characters and events and put them in fast forward because we got to get through a movie quickly while retaining the spirit of the novel. And I think Interview with the Vampire changes some things from the source material, as Josh referenced, but it's always in the spirit of moving the story along. The director refuses to be indulgent and instead takes subject matter that's largely inaccessible to the mainstream audience and makes it pretty easy to understand. So some of those changes that were made, like you mentioned, like, you know, lingering on Louise crazed brother challenging his faith or on Lestat sadistically toying with the dying Louis, it'd be yummy to me. Ash would probably relish that, but it's going to lose your average dick. And those are some smart choices that were made to make this a movie that could go into theaters and be successful. Yeah, I completely agree. I reread the book after watching this a couple of weeks ago, and I had forgotten a lot of the changes because it's become kind of like canon what happens in the movie because Anne Rice wrote the screenplay. And I think that's the big difference here is like John Steinbeck did not write Gary Sinise's screenplay of Mice and Men. She wrote this one. So it still feels like very true to the world. And Anne Rice has always made it very clear that this is the story of a home homosexual couple and their child. So it's Lestat and Louis and the fact that they raised this child, Claudia. And the fact that Louis had a more traditional, like at the time, a more traditional family, like with him being a heterosexual man and marrying a woman and having a child, I think it makes it so much more interesting because he's mourning this loss of a family and he's given a family all his own that he recreates with Lestat. And it makes the power differential there a lot more interesting. So now, like, I don't know when vampires started, like if they were in the 1500s or 1600s or whatever, but the 1790s, they seem like the golden age. This is a good time to be a vampire. Uh, You could just go out there. There's people on the street. Even the aristocrats can go kill some of them. Eh, It's plague. Oh, they disappeared. You throw them in the bayou. It doesn't matter, right? Modern times, being a vampire would suck. The internet, photographs alone, social media, it would be almost impossible to be a vampire today and get away with it for more than maybe a month or two. Yeah, and they kind of address this in the movie, whereas like the advice is if you're on a ship, like, you know, eat rats, don't eat people, because people are gonna notice that people are disappearing. They're gonna say, Hey, I, I wonder who's responsible for all these people dying. Oh, maybe it's a guy that's sleeping in a coffin. <laughs> that that might be him. But like Cities weren't that big in 1790. So there's one scene in the movie where they wipe out a whole fucking family. Yeah. And like New Orleans in the 1800s had like 102,000 people. So if you're bumping off aristocrats and rich people, you don't think anybody's going to notice six people dying in one night? Yeah, it's the worst part. And then they're all they have fancy taste. So, hey, where did Aunt Ellen go with her two like poodles? Oh, they were out there with that Lestat and that Louis guy. Really? Where? Oh, she's screaming. What's that? It's not like you're eating homeless people. Someone's going to know that Aunt Ellen or whatever the hell her name is is gone. I love that you took like decadent nobility and made her Aunt Ellen. I just appreciate that, you know, I mean, that's like the stats, like he's very gluttonous, right? Like he likes, what does Louis say? He has a taste for nobility, right? Like that that's the blood he prefers most of all, especially a young noble boy. And I think that that's really interesting about him. But to Big D's point about like social media, I don't think it would be that hard. It would just, they would all be like Paul Rudd. 
right? Like who like (laughs) never ages. But, you know, speaking of the types of vampires we see here, I think it's really important for those people who have not read the books to understand that like the Anne Rice vampire is very different than a lot of like the modern adaptations of the vampire legend. And what I love about this movie is that we get to that nitty gritty um, immediately. You've got the conversation between Slater and Pitt where you kind of get this explanation of rules, right? There's no crucifixes. There's no holy water, no damnation in the way that Stoker's vampires are, you know, nobody's stabbing crosses and, you know, they're bleeding all over the place, like in, in Dracula. And what I love about them is that there are these like hyper sexualized beings in the Anne Rice world. They they thrive on violence. They thrive on despair. And they're not bound by gender, or age, or life, but they are truly predators in a way that we don't get to see other vampires be. They're just these true like children of the night. They feed, they consume, they're all eroticy, if that's a word, right? And and I think that that's a really interesting piece of them that they are bound by only darkness. They have no other constraints to them. Whereas like in a Bram Stoker world or even like the Buffy world, you could take out a cross and, you know, they got to back away. These guys don't. They're really only existing in a prison without a sun. That That's it. And that makes them really powerful and it makes them a lot scarier, I think. And it also is one of the many reasons that I would gladly join them if given the chance. And Ash, that story is told visually as well. Like we've seen some amazing and some terrible makeup, frankly, in our five years of reviewing 80s and 90s movies. But some movies take that and elevate it into an art. I mean, I think about Blade Runner, right? Like they told entire stories to the character's makeup. Interview with the Vampire gets into your guts with Mm. the cosmetics. I don't know how they pulled it off, but everybody looks amazing. And I don't mean beautiful. I mean, amazing, fantastic, magical, that pale skin, the visible vasculature, the predator eyes, the long nails, they're simultaneously reminding us that vampires are monsters and seducers and killers and angels in a way like they somehow managed to capture all this on screen. And you can understand why a person would know they're about to be killed, but be helpless to resist like they don't look pretty. That's not the word I would use, but they look irresistible. Well, and I think that it's such a subtle thing they do with the makeup where Louis sees Lestat and we see Lestat through Louis's eyes as a human, and you can't see all of the veininess underneath his skin. And then when Louis becomes a vampire, that's when we start to see him in that way because Louis's eyesight changes to like this vampiric eyesight, right? And I think it's also why Twilight is such a just ridiculous insult to all vampires everywhere because they make a vampire that sparkles. Like, I mean, what the fuck, right? Because how is that supposed to be like a beautiful way to pay tribute to them? Because they're supposed to be predators, right? They almost look like cats, like the way they do their contacts. They look like a a predatory species. But I disagree. I do think they're beautiful. And like you and our commissioner, I saw the movie long before I read the books because I was way too young to read the books when this came out. And when I finally did, I was like, wow, like, I don't know how they would have ever found anyone beautiful enough to play these characters other than Brad Pitt, because in the books, they're described like these white marbled statues, like these beautiful creatures that are like unreal and how beautiful (laughs) they are. And Brad Pitt is beautiful as a human being. Like, I think we forget how gorgeous young Brad Pitt was and he was just exquisite and then he gets turned and he's got those light eyes and he's all undead and he looks like a fucking Botticelli painting like that's what he looks like and he's breathtaking and if you add to that brooding which I think is one of the sexiest things that a dude can do is be super angsty and brood. And there's this one scene where he like lays on this little like chaise in their, you know, in their room and he's all frustrated with the stat and he's just full of angst and he looks unreal. He's so fucking gorgeous in that scene. And it was just absolutely perfect casting. But like you said, they're hunters, right? So you want to pick a hunting partner that is some good bait. You mm-hmm. want to get the hot dude. You want to get the hot girl. Where is 400 pound Bertha, the vampire? Who is she going to lure into an alley to kill? 
it really it would suck. It sucked to be a 10 year old girl as a vampire. But imagine being like a 55 year old guy with a bad back or some <laughs> woman who isn't too attractive. That's the vampire you do not want to be. And, and the thing is, is that Brad Pitt, I mean, you mentioned that he's beautiful, but also he doesn't just look beautiful. He sounds beautiful. Sounds like mm-hmm. I could listen to Brad Pitt and consonant sounds as Louis being interviewed by Malloy for hours, if not days. I actually just enjoyed the scenes in the room in San Francisco where he was just listening to him talk and not do much else. I don't need food or water. I just need that gorgeous ASMR. I was surprised to discover years after seeing interview that Brad Pitt didn't like the role. Uh, He was interviewed about it and he said, six months in the fucking dark, contact lenses, makeup, I'm playing the bitch role. And that that really hurt me to read because I thought he was all in in this movie. Same. Louis can resist his hunger no more and feeds on a little girl. To entice Louis to stay with him, Lestat turns the dying girl, Claudia, into a vampire. Together, they raise her as a daughter. 30 years pass, and Claudia matures psychologically, but remains a little girl in appearance. When she finally realizes that she will never grow older, she is furious with Lestat. She tricks him into drinking the dead blood of twin boys and then slits his throat. Though Louis is shocked, he helps Claudia dump Lestat's body in a swamp. They spend weeks planning a voyage to Europe to search for other vampires, but Lestat returns on the night of their departure, having survived on the blood of swamp creatures. Lestat attacks them, but Louise sets him on fire, and in the ensuing blaze, they are able to escape to their ship and depart. Okay, so anyone who has not seen this movie in years, it takes itself very seriously. It's not as serious as Of Mice and Men, but it's setting a very distinctive tone. But then there's a quick shift here when we get Claudia introduced, and I absolutely loved it. There's some comedic scenes where it's almost like raising the vampire, the sitcom, where we get to see scenes of Claudia, who's now a vampire, and she's trying to learn. She, Uh-oh, she killed the piano teacher. Oh, no, she just killed the doll maker. Got to get some dolls. She's even hiding some food in her room. Uh-oh, she soiled her room. It is so good, so different, and it was so funny. It almost could have been a sitcom. I mean, Big D, previously on the podcast, you were making the case to me during the hook episode that the whole point in having kids is to see the world through new eyes and have yes. fresh breath introduced. Well, it's great. That's what Claudia does in the movie intelligently allows a little bit of levity in that moment to lighten the mood because otherwise it's going to be a two hour slog. And, and I welcomed it. I mean, she was fantastic. Great. Yeah. And it's nice to see some moments of happiness with Claudia because truly like her character is so incredibly sad and it's not just sad on its face but also the inspiration for it because Anne Rice lost a daughter soon before deciding to write the book and so she was inspired by the loss of her child to write about a child that could never age that could never get sick never die and her daughter is the inspiration for Claudia which is one of the characters I've always loved and You know, it's just so sad to think about how she's trapped in this like state of perpetual childhood. And it's so much crueler because, like, you know, Louis, he he complains so much about being turned and about how now like his soul is damned, but he he chose to do it. Like this little girl had like absolutely no choice at all in being turned and also now has no choice to mature physically in any way. And that would drive any vampire insane. And I know Kirsten Dunst was very young when she did this. But y'all, her performance has aged so beautifully. And like, what a fucking powerhouse. Yeah, Yeah, she's absolutely ferocious in this role. And also does this terrific job of like balancing the two vampire parents that she has. She understood the assignment, right? It's your part Lestat, your part Louis. And I particularly relished Claudia as Lestat's protege, like a perfect little killer. Those scenes were great, too, um, you know, where she's just playing the the lost little girl or she goes into a doll shop and she, you know, she scoffed at. So she just fucking kills the guy, takes her doll. And when she delivered that line after the first feeding where she says, I want some more, like I melted. I was like, come, come to me, child. Be mm-hmm. mine. No, no I, I agree. And I think her performance is amazing. It really is. Like you you watch it and you just have to remind yourself of how young she is. But I found myself having a problem. She's a 10-year-old girl who's now been a vampire for 30 years. 
she's a 40 year old let's just say a normal human right but she's still acting like she's five years old i would have rather had her like struggle more with the fact i would have liked to have seen her act like an adult in a 10 year old's body but instead she really doesn't and, and they they hint at the fact where she comes on to louis and she says you know you love me i i want you she's trying to seduce him does she and would it be wrong as a 40 year old human in a 10 year old body I mean, it's made very clear in the books that they're lovers. I mean, that's one of the first things that, that okay, Ar- cool. like, Armand has this whole um, telepathic conversation with her. And that's the first way- thing that he does is acknowledge the fact that they're living as man and wife there in Paris. Gene, as a man, uh, as a, let's just say you were a vampire, could you get over the visuals of a 10 year old form to make that child your lover, even though you know she's 40? categorically no <laughs> okay good answer that's a child yes. that's well, a what, good and answer. what is she in the book she's four right she's, i think she's six so like six. yeah yeah right yeah. there about good answer. But, good answer. but big d I, I like how you're like well i just want to you know see her react more to being old she's got a dead woman in her fucking bed and she's like going on murdering sprees i think she's expressing pretty clearly that she's not happy about being an adult in a child's body yeah, and I mean that's another big change from the book too, because you can't like hear people's internal monologues. But like she hates Louis too for a very long time. Like she just knows he's less of a a threat, and so that's why she kills Lestat. And I don't know, like especially watching it this time, I was really moved by Lestat's death. Um, I like most people was not a massive fan of Tom Cruise's casting, but this is the part of his performance that I appreciate the most because he's sitting at that piano and he insults claudia and talks about how her body will never you know look like you know the woman that he hopes that she's brought to him and you see in his face like him regret it immediately and he has this need like this deep need for her to forgive him and i don't know like in that moment i realized that maybe cruz gets a lot more flack than he should have and it's because of that awful fucking blonde wig but i i don't know he's not the lestat from the books but he's good in this he's the stat we have god knows he's a lot better than the one Stuart fucking townsend who plays him and queen of the damned who just don't even get me fucking started on that movie so i don't know i appreciate him this time yeah, shot the movie's hot take here, but Tom Cruise is my favorite performance interview with the vampire. I thought it was great. He took the character of Lestat and he made him Tom Cruise as Lestat, like a little less decadent than the books, a little more Tom Cruise nutty. I mean, Tom Cruise himself is barely human as is. So <laughs> seeing his little demigod aspirations manifest in such a fun character worked for me. Also, fucking beautiful. Like, I mean, Brad yes. Pitt looks good. But if I had to choose between the two, I'm fucking Lestat. Oh, God, no. It's Brad Pitt all the way. <laughs> Big D. <laughs> no, I... I, I, I you uh, going for Claudia. He's, I, he's brooding all the time. I, I think I would go for Tom Cruise. He'd treat me badly, but I'd sleep with him, and then I'd just kind of stick around for a while. But yeah, no. Brad Pitt, no. Mm. Big D's just down to bite some Creole boob. That's what he wants. <laughs> oh, let's do it. <laughs> you know, one thing that's often missed in Interview with the Vampire really comes through in the film adaptation, and it's the fact that Lestat is boring. Now, it's really hard when you're making a movie to be entertaining, but also have the character be boring and also have that come through with Tom Cruise. Yes, he's an unparalleled predator who toys with his victims. But if you look at what he really wants, like he's pissed when they lose the plantation, right? (laughs) He wants a steady income. He wants a roof overhead and he wants plenty of food. That's it. And Interview the Vampire raises the point that vampire life, it sounds pretty fucking cool. It sounds really exciting, but it's dull really quickly. You're basically just working for meals. You wake, you feed, you go to bed. And Louis and Claudia are the only ones who yearn for more. They want meaning and relevance. Lestat is happy to just do the same shit every day. He's like a boring boyfriend. He just wants to be loved, though. And I think that's what makes his character so sad. Like, he wants so 
badly to have what Louis has lost here. And so he tries to give it back to him by making Louis his companion. And I don't think before I had children that like I recognize that in Lestat. Like there's this like he just wants he's the opposite of fucking Peter Pan, right? He just wants the the husband and the kiddos. And like that's what he wants in his life. And he wants a prodigy. And I don't know. Like I felt really badly for him because I get Louis. I'm Louis. I'm the one wandering the streets, like, you know, having all these, you know, moral crises and wanting to know the meaning to why I exist and asking questions. And Lesage just like just come home and love me and let's turn some babies and have hot vamp sex. Oh my God. So now I, I know you two would <laughs> willingly become vampires, but why would you hang out with a vampire? Why? They're insufferable. Louie, I refuse to take a life. I can't do it. I can't. We get scene after scene. I can't kill. Oh, I feel bad. He doesn't have a fucking problem. He burned down the goddamn French Quarter. The whole French Quarter. He's Not a on purpose. He didn't Oops, mean to. Oopsie. Oh, I didn't mean to kill everyone. You know what? Maybe if he had sucked a couple necks, he wouldn't have had to burn down the damn fort. Goddamn French Quarter. But listen, okay. On a whole, vampires, if you're going to hang out, they're overly dramatic, they're unnecessarily melancholy, they are the worst, they're annoying, no one would choose to hang out with them. Um, you would? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So, as the regular guy, non-vampire expert, as I'm watching this, I'm taking copious notes, <laughs> and I'm trying to come down with some questions here that I can get our normal listeners who are not knee deep in the blood of the non-immortals who would have some questions. So here are some of the problems and some of the things that I want to know about vampires, right? Vampires, they want to stay incognito. I don't want to be too obvious, right? Okay. I don't go out in the daylight, but what could I do? Is a coffin really necessary? Can't you have some kind of black out the windows, do something else? Isn't a coffin a dead giveaway? I mean, in the books, Louis does sleep in his brother's church because it's overgrown with the vines and everything like that. I mean, you got to have a little bit of panache. Oh, mm. That's what I said. I, my next question was, was it a style choice or a necessity? So, okay, you said it's a style choice. Next, whenever the vampires are feeding and they're biting into their victims, there's almost like a sense of euphoria. Is there a, a, a narcotic or some kind of uh, medicinal like release from the vampire's teeth that makes the victim seem like they're getting off and not being bitten. So first of all, it's the way that Amrice vampires bite. This is the erotic piece to it, is that they mm -hmm. bite in a super sensual way, so it feels like a sexy bite rather than a I'm killing you bite. Okay. And the other thing that they do too is that their heartbeats sync with their victims, so they feel their lifeblood. So it's like this incredibly <laughs> like intimate experience for the vampires in, in Anne Rice's vampires, where like okay. I'm biting Big D and our hearts start beating in sync, and like I'm giving my life to you and you're feeding me with your life which is feeding my immortality and like it's like this dark gift and like it's very sexy and erotic and everybody enjoys it until they're dead i can't lie i became slightly aroused as you said that. <laughs> you're welcome okay next question why do they choose not to feed on men is this a flavor choice is this something else oh no they like to feed on men mm -hmm. they feed we, on we, men just we, fine we did not see them feed on any men you did who the Aunt Ellen's boy toy. No, no, we did not see it. He was he said, going to. He though. said, "Quote: We're not going anywhere." So and we Louis did not even, on screen see anyone feed. Right, but man. he even says to him. Well, first of all, it was ninety four, so like the homoeroticness was really toned down in this movie. Toned down, really oh, toned yeah. down. Oh yeah, really toned down. And it, he, I mean, Louis even says that Lestat's favorite is a young noble boy. Yeah, I mean, oh. Big D, to give you an idea in, in the book, okay. like the first little trick that Lestat plays on Louis after like Louis becomes a vampire, he's like, okay, you got to sleep in my coffin with me. Like on, on top up. of him. On top of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. You want to live? So, Get on me. Mm -hmm. I, I If this is toned down, I, I don't know what a non-toned down. Everyone is like, oh, come here. Just come on my neck. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, like this is this is again some really smart choices that were made in making this film is that they 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 toned down certain aspects of it. And I would call it like almost like Goldilocks of films. Yeah. In the sense mm-hmm. that they were like, okay, we gotta just turn that the, the homo dial down just a little bit, the incest dial down just a little bit. Um, and and basically make it so that it's like you could understand that once you cross over into this world, once you're born into the darkness, all the rules change. And if it's about decadence and it's about, you know, fully enjoying your passions and, and, and appreciating those things, then all the rules are different. And so, um, yeah, they, they toned a lot of it down. And what's, what's wonderful now is that I think now it would be much more socially acceptable. But in 1994, no. Okay, so here's my final problem. The dead blood thing, that is mm-hmm. the stupidest fucking rule a vampire has ever, ever had. Because you're going to tell me, oh, dead blood, I got to stop drinking before you die. But yet they can take the blood, put it in a cup, get the person dead, and they still drink it. No, 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 no. They can do that with animal blood. They can't do that with human blood. The problem with the human blood, the problem with it is that if the person's died, that is how the Anne Rice vampires feed their immortality. So like their heart doesn't beat anymore like ours does. And so the only time it does is when they're feeding on humans. That's why they have to constantly feed is because that's what maintains their immortality. When they say that he's going to starve to death, when they put him in the coffin later on, it's because he won't be able, he's like going to become like desiccated, right? Like he'll like completely shrivel up because he won't have any of that incoming. So like if you drink the dead blood, you're, you're not going to die, but you're going to be poisoned. Okay. So does that mean I got to get straight from the tap? Because they do put it into a crystal glass the rat's blood they do uh but they also do it with the prostitute right and, but like, she's alive time. so is it okay can i can i Her store some beating. blood so the so the way it's written in the novels big d is that if you're drinking from somebody and they die they will pull you down to death with them yeah. that's what Anne rice says but yeah. it's basically that idea that like as they plunge into death if you if you can't let go you're gonna get pulled down too okay so, so I did go down a little rabbit hole here because I want to do some chat on medical advice. So I kept finding myself wondering. I said, because you got to know when to stop when you're feeding because you don't want to get the dead blood. The average adult who weighs 150 to 180 pounds has 1.2 to 1.5 gallons of blood in their body. Damn. For you in Europe, that is uh, 4,500 to 5,700 milliliters. I thought you were going to say Europeans had more blood. I was very <laughs> no, excited. No, not yet. Not yet. We'll get to who has more blood. We're wet on. people. Okay. But most adults can lose up to 14% of their blood without really experiencing any kind of effects. You might get a little dizzy. You might get a little lightheaded, but you're okay. Now, when we get to hemorrhagic shock, this is at 20% of your total blood volume. This is when it starts to get more severe. And without treatment, you will die at 50% of your blood. So let's just say 1.2 to 1.5, an average person, you could drink 750, you know, like 0.75 gallons without a problem, right? So you got to really be pretty precise there. They seem a little loose with the blood. They let them hit the floor. I would be a little more, more careful. But if you are a vampire out there, did you know, Ash, that pregnant women... While they're ha- while they have a yes. fetus inside, they have thirty to fifty yeah. percent more blood volume than an average person. That's three gallons. It's also, why your heart beats so much faster when you're pregnant? Yes, mother of two. Did you know yeah. that pregnant women have more blood in them? Well, d- did you ever think you Shadow were more tempting to a vampire while you were pregnant? Do you keep thinking, "I hope someone will bust in my window and take me"? No, because I wouldn't want to be turned when I was pregnant. Gross. <laughs> That's gross. In my body, like when I was pregnant, I want to be like that for all eternity. <laughs> That's where we draw the line, Big D. Yeah, exactly. I don't want. I don't, I don't want to be a pregnant vampire. No. Yeah, I'm going to seduce men. I'm not going to work. Yeah, that's the reason why I was concerned about that is my inability to seduce the men. <laughs> yeah, you're going to starve. If you go way back in the Anne Rice lore, this is getting fucking super geeky, but. The dark gift was only given to beautiful mortals to spite yep. God. So. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, Akasha. After traveling <laughs> around Europe, but finding no, this got weird as shit. I'm so sorry, everybody. After traveling around Europe, but finding no other vampires, Louis and Claudia settle harmoniously in Paris in 1870. Louis encounters vampires Santiago and Armand by chance. Armand invites Louis and Claudia to his coven, the Théâtre des Vampires, where vampires stage theatrical horror shows for 
humans. On their way out of the theater, Santiago reads Louis's mind and suspects that Louis and Claudia murdered Lestat. Armand warns Louis to send Claudia away for her own safety, and Louis is intrigued to stay with Armand and learn about the meaning of being a vampire. Claudia demands that Louis turn a human woman, Madeline, into a vampire to be her new protector and companion, and Louis reluctantly complies. So now we get to Paris, and I can understand the need for vampires to congregate, to you know, create some kind of social society. They all understand the problems. Hey, man, I'm really hungry today. I didn't get to feed on anybody. Did you? Oh, me neither. Oh, I really miss the blue water. I wish we could go outside. It would be good for your spirits. You know, you want to motivate the vampires. But <laughs> practically, this is really difficult. If you're three person, let's just say a vampire team, you can easily feed throughout New Orleans. You get one or two people a night. It's not going to be that noticeable. When you have this giant group of vampires, they're going to clear out a city block. If they go out and get maybe one, then they share a second person. You know, they split a meal. This group would be (laughs) spotted really quickly. I don't know how much time you've spent in Europe, Big D, but I would say that a vampire theater in Mm -hmm. Paris is the perfect cover for a bunch of vampires. Uh, Theater people are fucking weird. They mostly go out at night anyway. They can kill openly on stage, which we see. Also, as I mentioned, it's fucking Paris. You can get away with anything in Paris in fucking 1870. Game on. Yeah, and it's not like they're each eating their own person. Like, it's a family style, right? Like, we see <laughs> like it there. Yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. having they're having little European meal sizes. They're having those yeah. tiny cans of Coke, not the American fucking liters. Right, right. Makes sense. It's a little tapas. Yeah, that's why they have the familiar or whatever his name is, that little boy. Right, you. you know? That's you. That's their yeah. familiar. You don't want to suck me dry right away. You right, just that's take a you little to bit. us. Yeah, you yes. just reach out your forearm yeah, you when we're feeling, first. A, little, oh, right, we're feeling a little hungry. Oh, I'd love to you to double team me. Get on me. Just t- take a couple of milliliters. It'd be great. I'm going to spend the rest of the night wondering how much blood Big D has in him. It's a fucking lot. I guarantee that. Oh, at least three liters. At least. <laughs> Well, first and foremost, fuck yeah to Stephen Ray. The dude is fucking incredible in this movie. And I'm sorry, I don't think he gets enough credit for this role. And I think we need the Parisian vampires here because Lestat is scary because he's got this huge bloodlust, right? But there's this really fear-inducing idea that comes with this coven of vamps because it's basically like a nest of Lestats. And we need to see that. We need to see them in their predatory packs. And that scene where Armand comes on stage and he makes the young girl feel safe and accepting the fact that they're going to kill her still plays so frightening the way that they're all in their cloaks they're getting hungrier and hungrier and then he tosses her back to them like a fucking chicken wing right and the way it's shot from above where they all back up and then are on her like a pack of hyenas it's done so well and i agree with joshua our commissioner I think that the only thing I wish here is that we had more time with Armand because he is an absolutely incredible character. But I do love the taste that we get because it's scary. And again, it's super necessary to understand the stakes of this, huh, no pun intended, the stakes of this world. And it's really, really good. Yeah, I mean, talk about a screen presence that makes your blood absolutely boil. Santiago shows up, doesn't say a word, and I hate him immediately. And this isn't like 41-year-old Gene Lyons hating him. When I was a kid and he first appeared on screen, I had two thoughts. One is, this guy's bad news. And two is, I don't like him. But he's not doing anything violent. He's just fucking around. And 25 years later, that same hate was fresh in my veins. To be able to pull off... That kind of performance, elicit that kind of response from the audience and not say anything is absolutely incredible acting. Mm -hmm. And I feel like everyone in this movie was at their peak. Christian Slater tones down his Jack Nicholson impersonation just enough to let Brad Pitt do his thing and be the star in that room. Kirsten Dunst, I don't think, has ever been better. Tandy Newton of uh, Westworld fame. She looks like a vision of Creole beauty and Antonio Banderas, as you mentioned, I don't know how he pulled this off. The dude, I mean, he's not a terrible actor. I thought he was pretty entertaining in Desperado, fantastic in four rooms, but 
if you asked me as a casting director to roll the dice on Antonio Banderas playing the oldest, wisest, and most powerful vampire in the movie, I would have said, fuck no. This was a very good choice, and I agree. More minutes with him would have really helped. Well, shortly thereafter, the Parisian vampires abduct Louis, Claudia, and Madeline and punish them for Lestat's murder, imprisoning Louis in a coffin and trapping Claudia and Madeline in a chamber where sunlight burns them to ash. Armand does nothing to prevent this, but the next day he frees Louis. Seeking revenge, Louis returns to the theater at dawn and sets it on fire, killing all the vampires, including Santiago. Armand arrives in time to help Louis escape the sunrise and once again offers him a place by his side. Louis rejects Armand and leaves, knowing Armand had allowed Claudia's murder so that he could have Louis to himself. So as I mentioned in the intro... This is the point where 21-year-old Big D fell asleep, was the power scenes. The, the, everything in the new world, I felt really compelling. It was beautiful. It kept moving. You get to Paris, and it kind of slows down. It drags, and it drags. And the Danny Elfman score, I, I know he didn't do it, but it sounded like he did. It just started to drone on and on and on. And I, I just, I, I, at this point, I started to lose it, and I felt like the momentum, like just, just stalled out. I agree that the second half, if we can call it, of this movie lacks the zest of the first half. Everything prior to the boat leaving New Orleans was fast paced, entertaining, zippy, I guess, for lack of better words. But it is hard to make sour times fun. No. I totally disagree with both of you. I think that this part of the movie is absolutely wonderful. And what was interesting is I always like to go and read like the critics reviews from the time, like just to see how it was received when it came out. And what's so funny is that the majority of the critics from the time thought that this was the most successful part of the movie as opposed Mm -hmm. to the beginning, because it does really capture the foreboding tone of the book better than the beginning because of those comedic moments that I do agree with Big D or I like them. I like the levity that Tom Cruise brought to the role. I do, but that is not what these books are about. Like they are not about happy times at all. And I don't know. I love the Paris sections because I think it's the only time that they get to how frightening these characters or these creatures can be. I would just like to bring up that the uh, critics of the time also thought that Malkovich's performance as Lenny was wonderful. It was award worthy. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point for sure. Um, But I will say that one thing that I think is held up well is Claudia's death scene. I think that it's played really smart here. When Louis goes in to find her, it's really powerful. The the effect of the ash being in the shape of she and Madeline, I think is still really, really beautiful. And it's interesting because it's so different than the book. So just a fun fact, if you've not read the Vampire Chronicles, we find out in the Vampire Armand that Claudia did not die like we think she does here, that actually Claudia makes this fucked up deal with Armand where he agrees to try to make her a grown up. And so he cuts off her head and tries to put it on an older person's body and believing that like by feeding her once her head is cut off, that she'll like heal and become, you know, like the neck will, I don't know, like fuse onto this older body. And it of course doesn't work. And Armand is thrilled by it because he does get Louis to himself. So he takes her body, puts it in the room with Madeleine and just lets her be turned to ash. So Louis never finds out about it. So it's pretty sneaky. Uh, But I found myself spoiled by 2020, 2021. You always expect the hero to come back and somehow have a miraculous save. I did not remember this part. So I kept thinking, Mm. okay, he's going to somehow kick the top open. He's going to go save her. (laughs) And when she finally does die, I was like, holy shit, that was effective. We need more of that today. You know, for all the complaining Brad Pitt did about having a (laughs) bitch role, they finally give him his action scene. Hey, you're going to take out all the fucking vampires in Paris. Go. And he fucking eats dog shit he drops the ball he shits his pants he's supposed to take out this theater of vampires and he goes in there with this like incredibly unwieldy sickle he doesn't look tough he doesn't look particularly furious he sort of just walks through the scene he's like okay i'm gonna burn this i'm gonna slice this guy i'm gonna knock this over 
and I'm out. I honestly saw more passion in the <laughs> Footloose warehouse dance scene or the hot rod, like punch it out scene <laughs> than what I saw from Brad Pitt here. You could tell he was fucking done at this point. I don't know. He looked all broody still, and he was beautiful while slicing Stephen Ray in half, which, by the way, looked fucking awful. That that real bad. That effect did not hold up, friends. No, but I, I, he's a fucking idiot. He deserved <laughs> it. How did you not know? The dude told him, "Oh, who is Lestat? The only violation which will mean ultimate death." Is if you killed a vampire. At that point, I'd be like, oh shit, this dude is reading my mind. I know we're in trouble. Let's get out of here. Let's get far away from this place. But instead, he stays there. You know you're done. And how deadly are these vampires really, man? This dude, Brad Pitt, came in there strolling, like (whistles) kicked over some barrels of kerosene, lit them up. They did not put up a good fight. These vampires, I think, might be overrated. Well, Big D, uh, it was a setup, right? Like mm-hmm. Armand wanted them gone. That's mm-hmm. why it was so easy to do. Yeah. So what did he do? How did he help them? There were there was nobody guarding the place. They were all already in bed. Like he basically got in scotch free, and and he knew it when they were having that conversation later. Like Louis knows, and 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 Armand basically confirms that. Like yeah, like I well, wanted to be with you. He was hooting the blowfishing, and mm-hmm. the rest of them could die. Right. And just to add to that, the the other thing is it's his gift to Louis because he knows he's taken like this thing away from him with Claudia. So he's complacent in that, but he allows him to murder all these others because Ar- it was good for Armand because he didn't want them around anymore. And it was good for him with Louis because he got, he was like, okay, I know I took away your little child bride, but you know, I let you kill them all. So now come live with me forever. You've got to see the world our way, Big D. Mm-hmm. Oh, See it yeah. through your vampire eyes. Oh, my goodness. As decades pass, Louis never recovers from the loss of Claudia and dejectedly explores the world alone. He returns to New Orleans in 1988 and one night encounters a decayed, weakened Lestat, living as a recluse in an abandoned mansion and surviving on rat blood as Louis once had. Lestat expresses regret for having turned Claudia into a vampire and asks Louis to rejoin him, but Louis declines and leaves. Louis concludes his interview with Malloy, prompting Malloy to beseech Louis to make him his new vampire companion. Louis is outraged that Malloy has not understood the tale of suffering he has related. He vanishes, and Malloy runs to his car and takes off while playing the cassette tapes of Louis' interview in his car. On the Golden Gate Bridge, Lestat appears and attacks Malloy, taking control of the car. Revived by Malloy's blood, Lestat offers Malloy the choice that he never had, and laughing, continues driving over the bridge. So in this section of the movie, after the the drudgery, as Big D would say, of Paris, we return to New Orleans. It's 1988. We get to see Brad Pitt in relatively modern attire. And my heart starts racing. I'm like, oh my God, it's New Orleans. It's like almost present day New Orleans. And then I hear the words Esplanade and Claiborne. And it gives me the terrible urge to like rush back to the city. Like I wanted to get up out of my seat and just run all the way back to New Orleans, walk through the Irish channel and just believe that every dark window and every Oak and every overgrown yard is hiding a vampire that's stalking me. And if people haven't walked in the night through New Orleans, you you always feel like something is watching you and the night just feels alive. It is the perfect setting uh, for this tale. And it, it got me to reflect on my relationship with New Orleans. And I realized that this movie was the start of it in 1994, where I, I understood the, the beauty and the magic of New Orleans. And then it just kept calling me back, like Tori Amos albums, Dixieland records. And when I went to college, my dorm mate, Colleen, uh, comes from an old New Orleans family. It took me back there for my first Mardi Gras, and then I went back there for mopeds, and then Gunner Grove with you know with the Arsenal fans, and now Ash. I just feel like this city. If I wanted to avoid it, I couldn't. It's got it's got tentacles. It just keeps pulling me back. Yeah, I mean, okay, it's very difficult for me to talk about this movie and not be like 
insanely homesick because being from New Orleans, it's it's my city, man. And New Orleans is it's intoxicating. And there's this great quote, John Goodman, he he said someone suggested that there's an incomplete part of our chromosomes that gets repaired or found when we hit New Orleans. Some of us just belong there. And I think that that is so true whether you are born there like I was or whether the city chooses you because I do think it's sentient in a way. It's like I don't mean to personify it too much, but it's like a person. And I think that New Orleans is like this complex like gumbo and it's like seasoned with like beads and beignets, which like the world knows the city for. But there's this dark like underlying base, like this rue that's about like these beautiful white gravestones as much as it is like these beat up cobblestones that make up the corner that they walk in this movie. And it makes so much sense that Anne Rice, who is from New Orleans, she's a daughter of New Orleans, that she made this the setting for this film because and uh, in her books as well because it's a city that's as old as it is young and it's it as alive as it is dead and the world there it opens up after midnight and like the vamps it's a city that's permanent you know the quarter that's shown in this movie looks the same today as it did in the 1800s if you walk along the mississippi like they do here the walk on the river looks absolutely identical there's just electricity now and there's something about the way that the moon reflects off of the mississippi if you've ever walked it at night in jackson square and i felt like eugene like this need to return because it it's guttural, it's animal, it's seductive, and it is impossible to resist for too long. It's why I go back every six weeks because New Orleans, it's beautiful, but there's this darkness at its core. And unfortunately, that darkness consumes a lot of people that go there and that live there, but it gives to others like me, I think like Eugene, and it finds us in our own darkness and it gives us a life within that darkness. It validates it inside of us and it connects us to one another, right? Like we find each other all throughout the world. And I'm sorry, but New Orleans, it makes you better than you were before you got there. And I fucking love it eternally. And there is no better place for this movie to be set than it. I felt like I was watching a Jeff Daniels like visit Michigan promotional video there, but I got to respect the fact of how much you love New Orleans. Normally, I would I'm sorry, poke fun a at Jeff it. Daniels visit Michigan. Yeah, he did a whole campaign about economic development and visit Michigan. Wow, well, visit so, Michigan's not fucking New Orleans. But but I'm just saying, like normally I would poke fun, but your passionate plea for the city—it's beautiful. It warmed my heart, so I it's- will say nothing. It's a beautiful place. And to wrap it all up, like thinking about Malloy, like I get him at the end of this movie. You know, Louis is so pissed because he's like, you've heard like the fear, the sadness, the regret I have about being undead. And Malloy is like, you yeah, no, no, but I want to be that too. And I understand that. I think it's this human thing. And I also want to be turned because they always call it the dark gift. It's big in the books. Louis says it all throughout the movie. And that's exactly what it is. It, it, it's, it's a gift. And I would be more than thrilled for Lestat to find me in my car and turn me because I'm that lady at the theater that stands up and says, take me. It's as true at 38 as it was when I was a teenager, as it was when I was, you know, a geeked out outcast, gothy, reading all this shit and like brooding myself on a chaise lounge somewhere, right? Like I wanted to be it then. I would be it now. And I mean, what about you guys? Although I can predict the answer with almost 100% certainty. Would you at 41 and 40 blank, big D, be turned. Uh, it's it's an interesting question, Ash, because I got to say that nobody in this movie seems to be having a good time. Uh, th- the way that the vampires are presented here, they are addicts and they all mm-hmm. eventually die, whether it's a grisly murder of getting your head chopped off or being set aflame or just becoming irrelevant and out of touch with the world, which is something we didn't really talk about that much at length in this podcast. But it's an interesting fact, right, that there's a psychological death as well and that you need to be connected to the zeitgeist in order to function, right? Um, Would I want to be a vampire? Certainly. Would I want to be an Anne Rice vampire? I I think you got to ask me again when I'm terminally ill. If you come back to me, then I'd be like, yeah, let's do it. But, uh, you know, but right now I've got my own forms of decadence that I'm perfectly okay with. You see, but, but I think like being a vampire is like crystal meth. It's a good idea. You think like, wow, I could be more productive. It's a good idea. Just listen. Hold on. When you start doing meth, you're like, oh, I'm tired from work. It makes me more productive. It's cheap. The idea of it, I'm just saying like, you're like, okay, I'm going to be immortal. I'm going to dress kind of cool. 
I'm going to have these cool eyes. I'm going to like sulk around <laughs> in, in, cool in the shadows. <laughs> I can see why you'd want to do it. Okay. It's kind of a cool lifestyle. I get that. But vampires, they're the worst. They're self-absorbed. They're insufferable. They pontificate nonstop. What's the meaning of life? They're like Rick in The Walking Dead. Can we go back? No, Rick, we can't go back. We've dealt with this for fucking 10,000 times. It's ridiculous. Everybody's got that vegan friend who all they want to talk about is being vegan. That's what vampires do. There's nothing else. And Lestat says it best. Louis, 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 still whining. I've had to listen to that for centuries. Watching this, I felt like I spent a lifetime listening to Louis whine as well. Well, now is the time in the podcast where we get to our wipe scores. It's our way of telling you how many wipes this movie would take to get off your respective. But Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is receiving the dark gift and seeing the world through vampire eyes. Five Wipes is an absolute disaster. It's being locked in a coffin behind a wall. Casco Amontillado. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Interview with the Vampire? So it's a weird moment for me because if we're talking about like my own enjoyment or feelings about a film, I would say this is a zero white. But I know that that's not a fair score um, because it's not a perfect movie for a couple of reasons. One, I I get that Cruz is not perfect. I I do think that he ruins some of the possibility of Lestat as a character. I also think it runs a little long, a little somber in parts. And while I love that and I respond to that, I get that it's a bit overindulgent in some scenes. and it also doesn't hit the way the book does. And I know there's this whole like book versus movie thing and how controversial that is. But there is this capability that I think is avoided here. Um, you know, who Louis is and what his story is capable of achieving, maybe they don't completely hit. Um, and it just isn't quite as effective. So I'm giving it 0.5 wipes because in its genre, this is one of, if not the best. And I, I really love it. And I was so pleasantly surprised at how well it has held up. Yeah, Ash, I agree. I also have to give a movie I wouldn't change at all half a wipe, uh, but for different reasons. Much like Full Metal Jacket, Interview with the Vampire feels naturally inclined to be two movies. Uh, part one would end with Louis and Claudia leaving for Europe, and that's the end of that movie. And then part two would pick up in Paris. The audience is unaware that Lestat survived the fire. And I think that sort of organization of splitting it into two movies would give us both more time with some really wonderful characters that we didn't get to fully explore. I mean, there were some characters in this film, if not all of them, that I would have loved to have an extra 10, 15 minutes with. It also would have made the second half feel like less of an afterthought, which I think is what Big D's chief complaint was. And I I agree with that part. Um, I say all that, but at the same time, I personally don't want this movie any other way. Like, it's a part of my childhood. It's a part of my life. It's something that I want exactly the way it is. And it has its own oddity because of the casting, because of the timing, because of the way it was laid out that I love for its uniqueness. And I, I don't want it changed. It would be like changing a family member or a friend. Uh, so what I would say is don't do this as a two-parter. Do not remake it. And please, God, do not involve Jared Leto in any interview with the Vampire Project. <laughs> So for me as the, let's just say the vampire outcast, I can't deny it. I I found the narrative style compelling. I wanted to hear more of the interview. I wanted to learn about the lifestyle. I thought it was a fluid way to go through the 400 years of Louis' life. The performances I thought were great. Kirsten Dunst fucking killed it. She's a child Mm. conveying the emotions of an adult. It was, I thought that was great. The set design, the quality of the production, it's fantastic. It holds up really, really well. So this is not a judgment on the vampire lifestyle, the vampire subculture. I think it's a one white movie. It runs a little bit long. I started to doze off again, but it's a good, high quality production, great source material. It is a one white movie. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, with one wipe from Big D, half a wipe from me, and half a wipe from Ash, that gives us a wipe score of 0.666 wipes for Interview with the Vampire. So, Gene, with the mark of the beast, Interview with the Vampire is now tied in the 25 spot with Die Hard, Groundhog's Day, Goodwill Hunting, and The Fugitive. 
You've drifted into like puss in boots territory now. I know. Yeah. It's Antonio Banderas. It still counts. Oh. Okay. I mean, Good Will Hunting is a fucking shitty movie, but I'm fine with the score. That's so nice. I, you know, I, I think that, like we said before, anything in this area yeah. of the Shat Pantheon and, and you know the upper mm-hmm. fifty is a quality film, and all of us can agree that this is an imperfect movie, but a very enjoyable movie. Um, so you know, I'm 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 comfortable with that too. Plus six six six, it's badass. Totally agree. And Gene, next week we will be taking on a film that is equally as loved as this, but I don't think will hold up as well. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist as con man verbal Kint. Drawing a comparison to the most enigmatic criminal of all time, Kaiser Slose, Kint attempts to convince the feds that the mythic crime lord not only exists, but is also responsible for drawing Kent and his four partners into a multi-million dollar heist that ends with an explosion in San Pedro Harbor, leaving few survivors. This was commissioned by Nixie, and he was the winner of the Shat Fantasy Football. And this was the F-U-T-B-O-L kind, not the NFL kind. It came (laughs) out in 1995, uh, and I remember loving this film, and I don't know how well it's going to hold up. Well, Josh, there you have it. Bragging rights against Adam. But Adam, thank you so much for your support through the years. And we'd like to thank all of our commissioners for making the podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatthemovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shout on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, shoutontv.com, where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please be sure to leave a five-star review that helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie and stay out of the daylight. Usually, when there is a crime, there is a motive. I want to know why. 27 men died on that pier for what looks to be $91 million worth of dope that wasn't there. Usually, when there is a lineup, there's only one real suspect. This whole thing was a shakedown. And there's no way they'd lie in five felons in the same room. But this is not the usual crime. This is not the usual motive. He was in the harbor killing many men. Kaiser Sose! He saw Kaiser Sose. And these are not the usual suspects. Keaton. I'm a businessman. McManus. There's nothing that can't be done. Hockney. What, you got a team of monkeys working around the clock on this? Fenster. Flip you. I'm flipping for real. Verbal Kint. Roger, really? People say I talk too much. He doesn't know what you want to know. I don't think he does. Not exactly. But there's a lot more to his story, believe me. In a world where nothing is what it seems. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled. He's here. Was convincing the world. I know, he's here. He didn't exist. You've got to look beyond the usual suspects. I'm smarter than you. And I'm going to find out what I want to know, whether you like it or not. I work for Kaiser Soze. He feels you owe him. He does not expect all of you to live, but those of you who do will have $91 million. It was Kaiser Soze, Agent Kuyan. I mean, the devil himself. I'm telling you, it's Kaiser Soze! There is no Kaiser Soze. Keaton always said, I don't believe in God but I'm afraid of him. Well, I believe in God. And the only thing that scares me is Kaiser Soze.